Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. So here we are with Wade Foster, the CEO and co-founder of Zapier. Um, I'd love to just see a show of hands of who knows what Zapier does, or who's come across Zapier or use Zapier. OK, that is helpful. Um, so I think what's interesting about Zapier is you have 2.2 million business customers. You're fairly extensively used throughout the startup world. So I think to kick off, it would be great to know, Wade, just what does Zapier do so everyone here kind of understands the product? Yeah, Zapier is a workflow automation product. It helps you automate uh, many of the day-to-day -day routine tasks that you might have across about 6,000 different apps. Uh, so a simple use case might be every time you get a new customer in Stripe, uh, ping me in Slack. Uh, a more complex thing might be uh, you're running ads on Facebook. Let's take the lead information. Let's run it through Clearbit to enrich it. And then based on a score, maybe we route it to Salesforce, or maybe you route it to an agent to make a call right away, or maybe you uh, send it into a newsletter app for uh, nurturing over time. Uh, but you can automate pretty much just any uh, task across any of these tools you use. Got it. And there's about 6,000 apps that are connected. Yeah, from you know, the, the stuff you probably heard of to a long tail of, of many, many very interesting niche products. Mm -hmm. OK. And what is your biggest use case? Like, who is using you the most for these? I mean, there's 2.2 million business customers. I, I assume there are a lot of small business customers. So who's using you the most? Yeah, a lot of small businesses use Zapier. Um, it's pretty horizontal. So we find folks across all sorts of industries, accountants, lawyers, real estate, startups, et cetera. Probably the most common one is folks in marketing uh, make up about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the users um, trying to automate you know, lead generation, CRM, content creation, a whole host of things that uh, help them with their job. But even then, at 10 to 20 percent, it's still a relatively small slice of the customer base. Got it. And how did you come across the idea? You know, my co-founder and I were, um, we'd met playing uh, blues and jazz and stuff like that. And we were always like pitching ideas back and forth. Um, I was a pretty poor engineer, and at the time I was uh, using the Marketo API, and it's this old Wizdle soap thing. This would have been in like 2011, and I was really struggling with it because I'm not that good of an engineer. Uh, and uh, Brian pinged me on chat and was like, you know, I think we could make something that made it really easy for, um, you know, your sort of uh, normal person to automate and integrate these tools that are connecting. We can put a little UI on top of these APIs, and then we can have it a trigger action based system where anytime something happens over here, we can automatically do uh, something there. And uh, because I was using this Marketo API, I was like, that would be great. I would love to use that instead of doing what I'm doing right now. Got it. OK. So one of the interesting things about your company is I was looking up on Crunchbase, you're a unicorn. You were valued at $5 billion, but you've only raised $1.5 million. So I was like, we're wrong. We're missing some funding rounds. I need to go <laughs> fix this. Um, and as it happens, you, that's all you raised. you raised. You were founded in 2011, raised a seed round with Bessemer and Draper in 2012. Um, that was around $1.4 million. And then fast forward for almost a decade, you don't raise any funding. And then you do a secondary in 2021 that Sequoia-led. Um, and that, the company was valued at $5 billion at that time. So how did you manage to, you know, most companies need to go out and raise large amounts of money in order to fund themselves. How did Zapier manage to not raise large amounts of funding and kind of ride it out? Yeah, I think there's, you sort of need, like, two things, I think, to go the, the, the route that Zapier did. One is... Um, you know, one is maybe more of like a personal choice. Like, how do you want to run your company? If you want to run it um, more of in a bootstrap manner, not be dependent on VCs, that's a choice you can make. Um, and then the second one is you need a business model that supports it. You know, if you have a lot of capital expenditures, it's just going to be tough to do a bootstrap. But um, if you have relatively low customer acquisition costs, um, you can make that choice. And so for us, we had. Um, worked at this company, Veterans United, uh, before Zapier. And um, you know, I was employee 500 there. And 10 months later, I left. And they had 1,000 employees. And so this is owned 50-50 by two brothers. They never raised a dime. Super fast growing. And so we'd seen that firsthand. And we're coming from the Midwest. So we're like, what is this VC thing? We don't really know what this is. So we're kind of like probably a little just oriented more towards this bootstrap path to begin with. And it made us a little bit skeptical of like the VC advice where it's like, hey, maybe you should raise money. No good company has done this. And we're like, eh, that doesn't sound true because we were at a great company that, that did it this way. So that orientation helped. And then with Zapier, one of the first things we built was our app directory, which helped us um, acquire customers really cheaply. You know, uh, it's mostly built on the back of SEO and content. Um, and so our cu uh, customer acquisition costs rounded to zero. And so those two things worked hand in hand and meant that we could have growth rates that looked um, as good, if not better, than many of our venture-backed um, peers. Uh, and we were able to you know, go the bootstrap route. 
And did the VCs want to push you to go raise funding, or were they fine for you to bootstrap and sort of grow? I mean, we got a lot of question, questioning eyes uh, over time. I remember folks saying, like, well, are you sure you want to run a lifestyle business, which is like one of the most condescending things you can say, because you're like, this, we're, we're just as ambitious, if not more so. Um, you'd hear things like, no, no major company has done it this way, uh, which also is not true. So you just hear all these things that you're just like, that, like there's, there's so many anecdotes to suggest that it's different. But if you're here in Silicon Valley, there's such an echo chamber around one way to build a company, one way to go do stuff. Um, and I, I think that does a disservice to the many different ways that you can build a, a company. There's, you can build a great company VC-backed. You can build it bootstrap. You can do one and done fundraising, kind of like Zapier did. Um, I, you know, I think there's, like, we all have the opportunity to carve our own path uh, in terms of how we go build companies. And do you think that has, beside the experience that you had your previous company, do you think that had a little bit to do with the fact that, you know, you are three co-founders, you're all still at the company 12 years later, you met at Mizzou, mm -hmm. which I hear is a hotbed for startups. <laughs> <laughs> so is it that you were a little bit out, and you obviously came and did YC and lived here for a while, so yeah. is it because you were a little bit out of that echo chamber or not necessarily, you just had your own path? I think it is like, you know, we didn't know what venture capital was really. We'd heard of YC, we'd heard of Hacker News, we'd heard of Paul Graham's essays, but we hadn't, we didn't, you know, VC was kind of this thing that, you know, these other people did, not, not for folks in sort of the Midwest. And so I think we had just a, a little bit of, call it imposter syndrome, call it skepticism. I'm not really sure, maybe some of both. Um, to, to the concept of, of venture capital. And candidly, like th the other thing I think that made it work, you mentioned the three founders. Across the three founders, we had all the skill sets to do a lot of this stuff ourselves. So we didn't have to go hire a lot of people right away just to build the first version of the product. We could do it on our own, um, which I think also helped because one of the biggest expenses for startups is hiring staff. Yeah. So you hired slowly. Yep. So one, one thing I did read about the company is that you released, I think that you hit 100, you were on 100 million revenue in 2021. Mm -hmm. That's pretty sizable. And that's the year where you were, you were valued at around 5 billion post money in the secondary financing. So that's about 50x. That is not valuations that we're seeing in this market today. Um, so do you have an update on revenue for the company? <laughs> no, no update to share uh, now, but uh, suffice to say, it's grown uh, quite a bit since. Got it. And you've been profitable since 2014. Yeah. Is that yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's quite a feat mm -hmm. for the startup ecosystem. So LLMs, you've integrated large language models into your product. I think you're doing it in a little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to understand how did you first come across the promise, or how did you first come across the fact that this was happening in the marketplace? Yeah, we, um, my co-founder started dabbling around with, uh, I guess it would have been GPT-3, this would have been, uh, yeah, 3, right before ChatGPT launched, and they were building um, just some products on top of it, like pretty, like, keen on this idea. Uh, I remember they actually made um, almost uh, a ver they, they created a little bot that you could text a phone number, questions and things like that, and then it would reply to you. And so I remember you know, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd ask it questions, be like, hey, you know, what should I get my wife for anniversary? Or what, like, you know, is there good shows for my kids to go watch or that, that are good, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I was playing around with this. This is a pretty cool experience. Um, about, you know, three weeks later, ChatGPT launched. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's a really good product. Uh, and, you know, I think it, uh, we started to see customers starting to do novel stuff in kind of like a lot of workaround ways with Zapier and uh, ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI's GPTs. And we started to say, hey, this should actually be more integrated into the workflow. Because now, um, if you add an AI step to a Zap, you can, it opens up a whole new category of use cases. Before with Zapier, you were constrained to um, things that use very structured data. You'd have to say, hey, I want to take this form, and I want to take name, email, whatever, map it specifically over to name, email inside of a CRM. But when you put an LLM in the middle, you can start to work with unstructured data in all sorts of interesting ways. So you can take you know, a big email and say, hey, extract uh, contact information out of this. You can, take, uh, you can feed it a bunch of context and information. You can say, generate a custom email for this. So there's a whole bunch of use cases that work really well when you put it inside of a workflow uh, container. And today, uh, you know, about 300,000 customers have delegated over 50 million tasks to AI using Zapier. Um, but that was something that was mostly born out of just watching customers start to like do these things and figuring out, well, we should just make this a lot easier for them because the first people that were doing it were doing it in a very like hackerish hacker, hacker ishy way. And so are you, you know, do you license with ChatGPT? Are your customers 
customers of ChatGPT and you're just the part, like how does that relationship work or are you using other providers? Yeah, all of the above. Um, so, you know, we have versions where you don't, you can just use AI tools straight through Zapier. You don't have to be a customer of these. You can bring your own tokens from uh, an open AI and Anthropic, et cetera, um, to use it. So we provide a whole host of different ways that are best suited for your business. So you can go figure out what works for you or you can just use our, the stuff that we're uh, using behind the scenes. And for us, we, we use a lot of open AI, but we mix and match models as well, depending on the, the use case. Got it. Um, and then, so was it difficult to integrate LLMs? Because this is something that, you know, m my understanding of your product is you're passing things through. And so mm -hmm. in some ways, you're not a repository. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So data moves through one app to the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is it a little bit different with LLMs? Does that mean you're creating more of a sort of central ecosystem which brings things together? Not, not as much. You know, I think the, one of the great things that OpenAI and others have done is uh, made available to these tools just through an API. And so Zapier under the hood works through APIs. And so it's a very natural integration for us. It works just like everything else should. I think the main thing that was challenging was just learning how these different, the, the, it's a new type of integration. You know, before with Zapier, it works exactly how you describe it, exactly how you want it to do. And with an LLM, you know, many of you have probably played with them, uh, it's, uh, it uses inference. It's not deterministic. And so sometimes it does what you expect, and sometimes it doesn't. And so figuring out how to use that as a feature and take away some of the bugginess aspect of it has been probably the most challenging aspect. Yeah. And is it difficult dealing with all of the providers, uh, the LLM providers? Uh, do you have deals with them? Uh, I mean, we, uh, we're customers of them just like we would be customers of anything else. It's pretty straightforward at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Um, so has you also uh, made an, an, um, an acquisition mm -hmm. of a company called Val. So my understanding is they're a sort of video conferencing tool. Um, so did that, um, so why did you need to make an acquisition in order to build out yeah, this, pro this product. So we, we launched this new product called uh, Central about a month ago, which allows you to build automations through natural language. So you know, with Zapier, if you've used the old school editor, you know, it's trigger, action, step, step, step. Uh, with Central, you can come in and set up bots just by chatting with it. You can say, hey, I'd like you to uh, take, um, say you wanted to like, set up rules for your inbox. You could say something like, uh, you know, if I get a lead from you know, my, my best contact reps, I want you to do this with it. If I get something that looks like spam, I want you to archive it. If you, if you get something that looks like this, and you can just describe what you want it to do. And then uh, Central will set up bots that automatically do this stuff. So with Val, uh, we, had come, we had this idea to go build this product. Um, but we didn't have um, a team internally that was ready to like, step up and go do that. Um, but we were eager to get, get going on it. And um, you know, as we, my co-founder Mike and I and were going sort of back and forth on this idea, we happened to meet Andy and the Val team. And uh, Andy and the Val team were trying to consider what options they, could, they, they should pursue. Should they try and raise more money? Should they go consider joining forces with someone? And they were working with video conferencing software. And with video conferencing software, their vision was to take all this unstructured data, you know, recordings of that, that were going on in videos, and try and create action items, try and create indexable search, et cetera. And um, they were using AI LLMs to help power some of the bits of the product. And we said, hey, we think we can do something similar, but instead of just having it constrained to video conferencing software, wouldn't it be great if it worked with everything? Uh, and so with Zapier and with Central, um, they, they joined forces with us to build the first version of that product. Got it. Yeah, and we are seeing more acquisitions in the private to private space because of exactly what you said, that it's a tougher environment out there. Obviously, they're in a very, very competitive space mm -hmm. in the video conferencing space. And so joining forces and making something bigger and better, um, that makes a lot of sense in this market. So you did tell me a very interesting story about a one use case um, for a sales customer using LLMs that you saw very early on. Mm -hmm. I thought it was um, indicative of how LLMs broadly are kind of changing the workforce. Do you want to tell that story? Sure. Uh, uh, you're talking about the the, um, the contractor with dyslexia? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. I thought so that was really One of the very first use cases we came across, this would have been probably 18 months ago now, that sort of really o opened our eyes to the potential here is um, we had a, a, a customer of ours that um, had a contractor who worked on uh, building a pool. This is a gentleman out in the UK. And this contractor was phenomenal at his job, great at every aspect of it, except he had one Achilles heel. Um, 
He was dyslexic. He communicated at the level of uh, a third grade student. And this really caused him a lot of problems because whenever he was trying to write correspondence with his clients, he just wouldn't come off as very smart, very intelligent. And so it really prevented him from uh, earning business, being viewed as a professional, et cetera. And um, this customer of ours thought, hmm, I bet I could help him out. Uh, and so he built uh, a little app on Zapier that um, allowed his contractor to send um, the correspondence he intended to send to the customer to an email address. That email address then went through Zapier to an open AI prompt that said, hey, rewrite this as if it was business correspondence, and then send it back to the contractor so that he can forward it to his customer. And this um, did two really impressive things. One, it worked, and so now um, this contractor could communicate properly uh, with his customers. So all of a sudden, this Achilles heel is gone, and now his business is thriving. The second thing that it served is he got to watch how the LLM rewrote his correspondence. And so he actually got better. His dyslexia improved, his communication skills improved at the same time. And so that was one of the first use cases we came across and we're like, holy cow, this stuff is gonna be pretty game changing uh, in terms of the, the amount of different ways people can utilize the technology. Yeah. So basically overcoming some of your weaknesses and playing to some of your strengths. Exactly. He, he was perfectly good at his job at just- 100%, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, so do you find that, oh, one thing I did want to ask you about just changing is you did make layoffs in 2023, and it was about 10% of your workforce, mm -hmm. about 100 people, you're around 750 people now, you're remote as a company, um, and I'm, I was just interested because we have seen this across the board, you know, the biggest tech companies all the way through to the smallest companies have done layoffs in the last two years pretty much across the board. Um, and given you were a profitable company, you're remote first, you've kind of been focused on the bottom line, mm -hmm. why, did, why was that a decision that you made to do layoffs? And as I say, it was fairly, yeah. it was kind of late into the game in 2023. Mm -hmm. I think there's like a couple categories of reasons why companies have done this. You know, I think we saw, you know, 2020, 2021, this, um, you know, low interest rate environment, zero interest rate environment that, um, brought a whole bunch of money into the ecosystem. And a ton of funding got handed out to companies that were maybe more speculative in nature than would have in prior generations. And you know, 2023, you see, uh, 2022, 2023, you see the interest rates um, go back down and all of a sudden there's a, uh, it dries up a bunch of funding. And so it creates this spiral effect um, where a bunch of companies decide to you know, make choices for a few different reasons. I think one, you saw companies that actually were in deep financial straits. It's like, hey, we're not gonna be able to go raise that next round of funding. And yeah. if we don't get our finances in shape, um, this company will go belly up. So you saw a lot of folks making yeah. for that reasons. I think you also saw- um, But that wasn't your- That was not our case, yeah. right? Yeah. In our case, you know, I think the other thing you saw was the emergence of LLMs, AI, and you saw a whole bunch of folks go look at their roadmaps and say, you know what, um, I don't think the things that we're working on are actually going to be relevant in this new world. And so if that's not gonna be relevant, what do we need to go spend time building? And in our case, we felt like, hey, we need to make sure that we have a team that is able to, um, react to this technology, sure. to take advantage of this technology. And when you look at a, a company that's relatively large, you can see it's not easy to take, say, um, you know, an accountant and turn them into an AI engineer, yeah. um, like okay. you might normally yeah. want to do. And so you have to rebalance yeah. a little so bit. So we don't have a lot of time. So I just want to, I have two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, so does integrating LLMs change the trajectory of your company? Does this make you into a different company and also put you in a competitive landscape with more companies very quickly? And then I have one more question for you. Yeah, I think so. I think we've gone from being an integration company to an automation company to an AI workflow company end to end. Okay, and does that mean you can pull, compete with more of the players out there that are going after that enterprise LLM space, or are you so focused on SMBs that you're kind of, you're in a different? Yeah, I think we're definitely, I think the, the level of competition in this space is absolutely increasing. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, more to come. Um, so one of the things that I think just to end off on is you talked about 
your product automates the most tedious parts of your day-to-day -day work, which really, to me, sounds like the promise of AI, and this obviously predates AI. Yep. So is this a coming-together moment for you as a product and a company? Yeah, I think so. You know, Before Zapier existed, you had to know how to write code to do this stuff. With Zapier, you could now do it through a UI, which was good for a lot of people, but it was still a little bit cumbersome. And I think you put an LLM on top of it, and you can start to see another step function improvement in the ease of use of automating these tedious tasks. Got it. OK, well, thank you so much, Wade. We appreciate it, and great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>